Thank you for joining today's webinar from LICOR, Quantitative Analysis for Western Blot Normalization. The webinar recording and slides will be sent out by email to all registrants. If you have questions at any point during the webinar, please type them into the questions box in the panel on the right side of your screen. Our panelists online will be answering questions throughout the webinar. Our speaker, Steve Shiflett, is a Technical Product Manager at LICOR Biosciences. He received his Master of Science in Biochemistry and Molecular Genetics from the University of South Florida. Since 2000, he has spent most of his career developing protein biology and cellular imaging and analysis products. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve. Thanks, Emily, for the introduction. Uh, the first thing I'd like to mention is the, the first webinar uh, that you can refer to for a, a much more comprehensive overview of normalization. Uh, today's webinar will be providing specific examples of linear range detection, uh, how to evaluate and validate housekeeping proteins, as well as uh, some basic examples of how to actually normalize uh, Western blot data. Today, uh, we'll begin by reviewing some basic terms and definitions, uh, as well as, as explaining why and how uh, some of these, these terms and definitions are important. So why are qu quantitative Western blots important? Uh, the purpose of doing a quantitative Western blot is to be able to measure relative changes in protein expression based on a particular treatment or conditions. Can quantitative Western blots be improved? Uh, the answer to that question is yes. Uh, and normalization is, is the technique or incorporated into the, the quantitative uh, Western blot process itself, uh, which actually provides a baseline uh, to compare changes in protein expression levels. So what is actually the definition of Western blot normalization? Uh, it's the use of an internal loading control to mathematically correct for small unavoidable sample-to-sample -sample and lane-to-lane -lane variations. Uh, and the reason that's important is it's not possible to load exactly the same amount of protein from each sample. Uh, and even if it were possible to get the same amount of protein from each sample into a gel, uh, transfer efficiency from the gel to the blot would be different for each lane. So accuracy and quantitative immunoblotting really relies on, on appropriate normalization and minimizing error uh, to the extent possible at each step of the process. The internal loading control itself, uh, a requirement for that is that it always be an endogenous protein or proteins that are unaffected by experimental conditions uh, and used as an indicator of sample concentration. I'll, I'll go into, in, in a few minutes, uh, how and why it's important to make sure that those internal loading controls are not affected by experimental conditions. From, a, from the standpoint of, of, again, from a quantitative Western blot standpoint, uh, when you see changes in band intensity, you really want to be able to know if those changes represent differences in, uh, in your target protein expression levels or are they potentially due to, to uh, variability in the sample prep, the loading, uh, the transfer, and so on. Uh, in the small uh, clip of the blot that I've got right here, uh, that, that's a good e example of, of what I'm talking about, which is, in, in this case, all of the, the, the samples are exactly the same. So the differences in band intensity that you see for the first three lanes uh, aren't due to biological change. They're actually due to uh, errors in, in uh, loading itself. So normalization is a way that, that allows you to, to correct for and adjust uh, for those, those errors, those unavoidable errors that are always going to be a part of the Western blotting process. So what types of, of internal loading controls are typically used? Uh, there are three basic categories. Um, the first is an internal reference protein, and probably the one that, that most people are familiar with, uh, commonly referred to as housekeeping proteins, actin, tubulin, and GAP-DH are examples of that. Uh, total protein staining uh, is, is increasing in popularity for some reasons that I'll go into uh, in a few minutes. Uh, but examples of that would be uh, a near IR fluorescent stain like revert total protein stain that, that's uh, suitable for use on Odyssey instrumentation, uh, Ponso S, and then uh, Kumasi or, or other examples of total protein staining. The third category uh, is uh, evaluating or looking at post-translational modifications. 
Uh, and a common example of that would be uh, a phosphoantibody combined with a PAN antibody. Uh, and a PAN antibody is, is an antibody that detects all forms of that particular protein and allows you to make evaluate relative changes in expression between uh, the, the, all forms of that protein versus a phosphorylated, ubiquinated, or glycosylated uh, state of that, that particular protein. Uh, for a much more thorough review of each, each type of these common loading controls, uh, I would refer you to the first webinar uh, where we delve into much more detail about each of these, these three types of internal loading controls. So as I mentioned briefly uh, before, uh, Western blot uh, in a perfect world uh, would allow you to, to load exactly the same amount of protein in every gel, not have any transfer issues uh, or any uh, other types of, of unavoidable errors that, that might be introduced into that process. Using the process of normalization, uh, it allows you to actually correct for some sources of variability uh, that are going to be inevitably introduced into your Western blotting process. Uh, the, the first type uh, is, is really going to be uh, unequal protein sample concentration. The second category would be inconsistent sample loading across the gel. And then the third type would be transfer variation itself. And when it comes to uh, estimation of total protein concentration, that, that's something that probably can't be emphasized enough. Uh, it's really not safe to assume that your lysates all have uniform protein concentration, uh, even if you're using a commercially prepared or available lysate. Uh, in this case, uh, we, we've evaluated a number of different commercially, evalu commercially available lysates. Um, each lane in this gel was, was loaded with 5 micrograms of, of the lysate based on the manufacturer's reported concentration. We then transferred those proteins to a membrane, uh, and stain the membrane with revert total protein stain, and the, the total intensity was measured uh, for each of the stained uh, lysate samples. Uh, the graph on the right uh, actually further depicts the uh, wide variation between each of these, these commercially available lysates, uh, and the CV actually across these lysates in this particular example was about 28%. So again, uh, you really can't assume uh, that all of your lysates have a, have a uniform protein concentration. So what happens if, if we actually do a protein assay on those, those lysates? Uh, th to minimize uh, error, you really have to take this step and be able to adjust for, for sample concentrations and, and make loading as consistent as possible. Uh, in this case, we use the BCA assay uh, to determine the protein concentration of each of these samples. And again, uh, repeated that, that first set of experiments by loading 5 micrograms of lysate based on the, the results of the BCA protein assay uh, in a gel, transferred those to a membrane, uh, stained with a total protein stain, and then measured the, the signal intensity uh, of, of each of these blots. And in this case, you can see that the CVs are dramatically reduced. You've got much more uniform loading. Uh, and again, the sole purpose here is, is to minimize uh, error to the extent possible. Uh, and loading the same total amount of protein uh, not only accomplishes that, but also allows you to, to make much more accurate comparisons uh, from sample to sample. Another issue that, that does occur uh, to some extent, and I'm sure this is something that everybody can, uh, can relate to, is when loading a gel, oftentimes you get uh, some of the sample that might spill over from one well to the next. Uh, you can have difference, you know, and this can be due to a variety of things. Uh, you know, most commonly you've got an air bubble or just differences in sample viscosity uh, that, that might push some of that sample over into an adjacent lane, and that's actually what you're looking at here. Uh, so th this is something that's not uh, possible to eliminate entirely. Uh, however, you, you can actually identify uh, variation that's been introduced this way by running replicates, uh, which is the case here, and you can actually use normalized to, to reduce the effects of, of this type of variation. So the next example, uh, or, or the, the, the third uh, example that, that's, that's common to uh, how, how you might introduce variability into your, your Western blotting process is through the, the actual transfer itself. Um, temperature, temperature, 
membrane binding capacity, membrane position in the transfer tank, and edge effects are, are all things that can contribute to transfer variability, uh, even when you've loaded uh, equivalent amounts of protein in each lane. And the example on the right uh, is a representative example of that. Uh, it's something that I'm sure everybody has, has experienced or seen before if, if you've done any amount of Western blotting. Um, and in this case, what we've done is, is used revert total protein stain again uh, to, to stain the membranes prior to, to actually doing any immunoblotting. Uh, and, and by incorporating uh, a, a stain in the process, uh, it, it will allow you to determine if you've got any processing regularities uh, that might actually require you to run the blot again. Uh, the blot on the right, uh, which is the example of pore transfer, uh, more than likely is not something that, that you would want to do any quantitative analysis on. So one of the other things that, that's absolutely critical uh, to doing quantitative analysis is making sure that you're uh, detecting both your target and your internal uh, reference control uh, in the linear range. Now, what does that actually mean and why is that important? Uh, outside the linear range of sample protein loading, the relationship between the amount of protein and the measured signal is, is unknown. So a prerequisite really for any type of quantitative analysis is making sure that you're detecting your target or your sample in the linear range. And as I mentioned, uh, making sure that you're working within that linear range is, is really a requirement for normalization. Uh, the target protein and the internal loading control that you're using uh, must fall within the same linear range to be able to accurately uh, quantify and, and normalize your Western blot. And in the figure here, what you see is actually uh, a linear range that's been determined for a target protein uh, in this cartoon, uh, as well as the internal loading control itself, and then the, the combined or the overlaid uh, version of, of both of those, uh, just, just to, to provide an indication of, of where you actually need to be, be working. And again, for accurate normalization, you, you want to make sure that you're only working within the range, within that particular range of, of sample loading. And what are the basic steps for uh, how to determine the linear range uh, of detection for your particular system? Uh, the first step is, is bas basically just to prepare and load a, a gel with a two-fold serial dilution of your, your sample, uh, as well as your internal loading control. Uh, in the case of uh, near IR fluorescence detection, you've got two channels to work with, so this is something that can be accomplished very easily at the same time. And then you're going to quantify the signal from the target and the internal loading control, and then plot the signal intensity values versus the uh, concentration range to uh, be able to assess what the linearity of the system looks like. Here's an example using actual data of what... Uh, what that might look like. In this particular instance, the target is BCL2, uh, which is involved in apoptosis, and we evaluated four different housekeeping proteins along with the target. And what you can see is that as the amount of lysate increases, the target signal looks linear to about 10 micrograms. Uh, however, several of the housekeeping proteins actually fall apart pretty quickly. Um, in this particular system, you get a pretty linear response for COX-4, uh, tubulin, and the target at about 5 micrograms of lysate. So based on this, that would be a good starting point uh, to begin your experimental analysis. And one of the things that I'll mention here, uh, just to draw people's attention uh, to the importance of actually validating housekeeping proteins, and these are instructions from the Journal of Biological Chemistry, is that housekeeping proteins really should not be used for normalization without evidence that experimental manipulations do not affect their expression. Uh, and the primary reason that that's important is that if you've got a target protein that you're trying to measure relative changes in expression on, what you're normalizing that against uh, shouldn't be another moving target as well. This is uh, some example data to, to uh, demonstrate and, and show you the process of, of validating uh, a couple of housekeeping proteins in a particular system. Uh, in this case, uh, these are Jerkat uh, cell lysates that have been treated with uh, varying percentages of etoposide, uh, which induces uh, apoptosis, chemically induces apoptosis. And uh, 
in this case, the, the membrane has also been stained with revert. Uh, you can see that we were evaluating tubulin and COX-4. And then uh, one of the things that we've also incorporated into this uh, is, is a new product that's not quite yet available, but, but will be soon, is the Odyssey Loading Indicator. And this is an external protein which allows you to simply measure, uh, it provides a, a very simple and convenient method for determining the, the consistency of, of sample loading between gel lanes uh, and to some degree uh, Western blot transfer. So uh, one of the things that you need to do, uh, as I mentioned, you, you cannot use visual assessment of band intensity as an indication of, of what's necessarily going on within that blot. Uh, you need to plot those signal intensity values out, uh, in this case versus the, the concentration of treatment. And what you can see here, uh, in the case of, of tubulin, uh, you actually see a pretty dramatic decrease in the, the level of tubulin that's expressed uh, as the amount of, of uh, treatment increases. Uh, COX-4 is, is affected to some degree, although certainly to a much lesser extent than uh, tubulin. And the other two things that, that you can use as references here to make, you know, as an indicator that what you're seeing aren't due to, uh, the changes you're seeing aren't, aren't a reflection of sample loading error or protein concentration error, uh, is the, the revert line for total protein uh, is, is very stable and constant. And the uh, Odyssey loading indicator line is a nice straight line, too, which, which means that you didn't have any gross errors in, in pipetting that would account for the changes that you're seeing. So based on this, this combined data, uh, you can really conclude that uh, the, the housekeeping proteins are being affected by the treatment conditions. Uh, and in this case, uh, you know, neither one would probably be a good candidate for normalizing your data. This next uh, experiment was simply to, to demonstrate, you know, what can happen. Let, let's say we pick tubulin, which we know is affected by the, the experimental treatment, uh, and we use that to normalize our, our target, uh, which in this case is BCL2, uh, versus normalizing that target to uh, total protein that, that's present in each, in each uh, of the sample lanes. And what you can see here uh, is the effect of using a, a housekeeping protein that, that's not stably expressed uh, to normalize your, your target. Uh, in the case of, of total protein stain, uh, the, the target between 0 and 100 percent decreases about 19 percent uh, compared to uh, using tubulin, which is not stably expressed in this particular, si uh, in this particular system, uh, w would would erroneously lead you, lead you to believe that, that your target protein only decreases about 2%. So it, it's very important to, to take into consideration if you're using housekeeping proteins that uh, they are unaffected by the experimental conditions. Uh, housekeeping proteins that are not stably expressed uh, may, may affect the, the data analysis itself. Uh, so you, know, you can draw potentially draw completely different conclusions about uh, what's going on with the target protein if you haven't uh, characterized or validated the housekeeping protein that you're using to normalize the data. And this is a completely different system, but I wanted to include this just to, uh, to you know, as a representative piece of data to, to show you that, uh, you know, the, the prior set of data doesn't mean that housekeeping proteins are bad. Uh, it's just a way to, to demonstrate that in this particular system, the housekeeping protein, uh, which is COX-4 in this case, uh, is actually stably expressed. It doesn't appear to be affected by uh, the experimental conditions. In this case, we were uh, using TPA to stimulate uh, phosphorylation of PERC. Uh, and what you can see is the PERC signal is, is increasing, as you, as you might expect, uh, based on in increasing amounts of TPA. Uh, COX-4 uh, fluctuates a little bit, uh, but I, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't say that, that based off the treatment conditions that it's affected to any appreciable extent. And again, in, in this case included the Odyssey loading indicator uh, is, is part of the process to assess the uh, uniformity of, of sample loading. So the changes that you're seeing here uh, you know, are, are not due to differences in, in sample loading. Uh, they, they are real.
So again, the point here is that housekeeping proteins aren't bad. You just need to know and understand what's going on with a particular housekeeping protein in your system before you decide to, to use it to normalize your data. So the next slide uh, is just another one of the uh, more current recommendations from the Journal of Biological Chemistry for normalizing Western blot data. Uh, normalization of signal intensity to total protein loading uh, assessed by staining membranes uh, using Kumasi, Ponso S, or other protein stains is the preferred method. And one of the primary reasons for that uh, is that using a, a total protein stain to normalize your data really reduces the impact of biological variability. Uh, treatment conditions uh, are much less likely to affect the, the total protein content uh, of your sample uh, as opposed to using a single reference point uh, like a housekeeping protein. Uh, total protein stain normalization, uh, at least in the case of revert, also does not interfere with uh, target detection. Uh, and it also, uh, just like some of the earlier examples that I showed, really allows you to, to evaluate the consistency of sample loading uh, across gel lanes as well as the uniformity of, of Western blot transfer. Uh, one of the, the other big advantages of using a total protein stain approach is that it's much easier to actually detect your target uh, in the same linear range as, as the total protein uh, normalization method. Um, one of the issues here is that, that housekeeping proteins can and, and certainly are used effectively uh, in many situations. But one of the issues that you encounter is that housekeeping proteins are routinely expressed at much higher levels than your target protein. Uh, and this can present challenges in terms of trying to identify a linear range uh, for both your target as well as the housekeeping protein that, that actually overlap. So having this, this really broad uh, linear range for your total protein stain, in this case revert, uh, it's got a, a wide linear range of, of about 1 to 60 micrograms. Uh, it's, it's going to be much easier to detect revert in your target in the same linear range. Uh, as you can see with the, the housekeeping proteins, um, as the, the amount of uh, lysate per lane goes up, uh, there are certainly regions of, of linearity, uh, but for most of those, they, they actually fall apart pretty quickly. Uh, and, and when that happens, the linear response is lost and the signal intensity is not proportional to the abundance of the control or the housekeeping protein. So what I wanted to show you here is just a uh, schematic of the workflow for using a total protein stain like revert. Uh, in this case, uh, you simply transfer your proteins to the membrane, uh, briefly rinse the membrane in water, uh, Incubate the membrane with the stain for five minutes. Uh, give it two brief rinses in a wash solution uh, and detect uh, revert in the 700 channel of, of the Odyssey uh, instrument or the Odyssey imaging system. Um, there is an optional reversal step that, you know, official reversal step that can be done if you want to detect targets in both the 700 and the 800 channels. However, this reversal step is, is not necessary uh, if you're going to be detecting targets uh, solely in the 800 channel of, of the instrument. Uh, this is all done uh, pre-immunoblotting uh, before you've, you've actually incubated uh, your, your sample with, uh, with antibody or done any of the blocking steps. Uh, one of the things that it allows you to do, like I mentioned uh, previously, is is evaluate the consistency or the quality of the transfer process itself. So it's possible after staining the membrane, uh, you may determine that you had some, some transfer issues uh, and that, that uh, the blot uh, is not suitable for quantitative analysis. Uh, so it could be a huge time-saving step uh, from the standpoint of, of not uh, going through the blocking and, and antibody incubation steps uh, before you, you can determine that you had some issues with your blot. So now I'll move on briefly to uh, a third type of, of internal reference control uh, that's used to normalize target signals. Uh, in this case, uh, I'll start with the, 
uh, again, with the Journal of Biological Chemistry re recommendations, uh, which is, is for uh, evaluating post-translational modifications. Uh, signals obtained using antibodies uh, specific for phosphorylated epitopes should be normalized to the total protein level of the, that target protein. So multiplex fluorescent detection is a great tool for the quantitative analysis of post-translational modifications, uh, among other things because it avoids the variation that's introduced by stripping and reprobing uh, of the blot. Uh, one of the reasons that you may have to do that uh, when looking at, at PTMs or post-translational modifications is because uh, it's the same protein uh, in the, the modified version of that protein. In this case, uh, we're, we're looking at the phosphorylated version of EGFR uh, that's been stimulated by or induced by EGF treatment. Uh, those proteins may actually uh, co-migrate uh, at a very similar, if not almost identical, uh, molecular weight uh, in the gel, which is exactly what, what you see here. Uh, so having those two channels to work with allows you to actually evaluate or view uh, the unmodified version as well as the modified version uh, in parallel uh, and, again, avoids the, the uh, uh, error that's introduced by stripping and reprobing, uh, among other things. And here's an example, or, or here's actually what the normalized data uh, from that particular experiment looks like. The non-normalized data it looks like you've got about a 19.9-fold uh, change or increase uh, in uh, phospho EGFR uh, compared to the normalized data, which actually reflects a 19-fold increase. So you can actually see that uh, EGF actually induced a, a very robust uh, increase in the amount of EGF or protein and normalization of that data uh, was effective or, or did have an effect on on the outcome of, of how you might assess or evaluate that particular experiment. Uh, and again, just to uh, talk about stripping and reprobing for just a moment, uh, it's, it's something that can certainly be problematic when you're looking at post-translational modifications, uh, but it, it can be problematic in, in general as well. Uh, it, it's basically a quantitative trade-off between antibody removal and, and total protein loss. So the process of stripping and, and reprobing uh, from a quantitative standpoint is, is going to introduce additional variability or error in, into your results uh, because it's, it's not a uniform uh, linear process. So how do you actually analyze the data the, uh, the normalized data or generate a normalization factor to use to, to normalize the data. The first step in this process uh, is to actually calculate the lane normalization factor. Uh, how, you, how you do this calculation is, is uh, very similar for each type of internal loading control. And what you're doing is finding, uh, in the case of the housekeeping protein, which is the first example that I have listed here, uh, finding the lane with the highest housekeeping protein signal and using that as the denominator uh, to divide uh, the housekeeping protein signal for each of the adjacent lanes by. And I think this can better be illustrated here uh, in this next uh, example, which uh, in, in this case we're using revert total protein stain or the total protein normalization method. And what you're doing is drawing a, a box around the entire lane. Uh, we've got four lanes here that we're looking at. And in this case, uh, lane C has got the highest signal, uh, which happens to be 1,000 in this case. And you're dividing the signal for each of the remaining lanes by that signal from the highest lane to generate a lane normalization factor. So the calculation is, is very straightforward and simple. And then you're actually using that, that lane normalization factor to calculate a normalized signal for your target protein uh, that's in each of those lanes, which is the target signal for the corresponding lane divided by the lane, normaliza lane normalization factor for that corresponding lane. So uh, what about reusing normalization factors? Uh, it's important to keep in mind that normalization factors really need to be calculated for each blot. Uh, it, it's something that's specific to that blot uh, and, and really should not be uh, reused between 
lots, even if the samples are exactly the same. So in summary, uh, there, there's really no best way to, to normalize your data. Uh, you've got several choices depending on the, the type of system that you're looking at. Uh, you just need to understand how each of those methods work and why. Uh, housekeeping proteins, uh, you know, being a good example of, of that where they require some additional value, validation and characterization uh, to see if they're suitable for your particular uh, biological system. Uh, the other thing uh, to keep in mind is, is really, uh, just like any other technique, you want to minimize the amount of correction uh, that's needed. So being able to, to monitor and assess the, the uniformity of transfer, making sure that you're using a protein assay to uh, calculate the amount or estimate the amount of, of protein that's in each of your, your samples uh, to where you've got uniform loading of your samples uh, is, is absolutely critical. Uh, the last thing I'd like to point out, which uh, hopefully I've illustrated here, is that Lycor uh, really has solutions uh, from both the reagent standpoint and an instrumentation standpoint for all of the, the, the normalization methods or for the three most commonly used normalization methods. At this time, we'll, we'll take any questions. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending.